In this section, I'm gonna talk about perforator veins, leg ulcers, when we should and should not treat perforator veins, which ones are necessary to treat. Uh, so historically, we were treating the saphenous vein with ablation, great and small saphenous vein. Uh, and we would treat the varicose veins with sclerotherapy, with a foam sclerotherapy. And what we observed back in you know, the early 2000s was that when they had big varicose veins attached to a perforator vein, we treat them, and they come back six months later and be open again, it was these perforator veins. So we started doing uh, perforator ablation. I, I did some uh, work with the company uh, Cool Touch for an FDA approval for lasers for perforator veins. We did about 400 of them. And what we found is that if we treated the large varicosity with sclerotherapy that's associated with the big perforator vein, you know, they, they, they wouldn't come back. We also found that if we treated people with you know, really ugly legs and they had big perforator veins, we'd make the ulcers go away. Uh, I want to show you a little clip about Jerry. He's a patient I saw back in 2005 or six. His doctor referred him to me. What kind of pain was it? Shooting pain? Was it throbbing pain? When you went to see Dr. Moak, what were you thinking was going to happen? Were you hopeful? And he had had previous uh, stripping. He had multiple DVTs. I think he had a Greenfield filter. He had some partial occlusion of his femoral vein, different sections. And he was just loaded with perforator veins. And he had the left leg was like a giant leg and it was, had ulcerations that recurred for years. He had been in a wound care center for about five to seven years. He was in a wheelchair or a walker. Uh, really had limited mobility and really an ugly leg. And over a period of about a year and 16 perforator treatments, we restored his circulation, leg got better, and swelling went down a lot. And I had an opportunity to see him again last year. He came in with his daughter who had venous disease. This is hereditary. And his leg was a normal size. He had two similar to legs. He also was got rid of his wheelchair, then his walker, then his cane, walking, actually his wife says he walks like crazy now, he's walking all over the place. And really just changed his life. He's still got some dry skin, it's still a little discolored, but nothing like it was before. And currently, you know, I'm having issues where I'm running into some situation where providers may are nervous about treating those patients because they're so bad. And I want to talk to you about how do we make those decisions because there are no contraindications, no absolute contraindications to ablation. There might be some ways that you change your game plan or the timing, but there are no absolute contraindications to treating uh, venous reflux. So we're talking about, first off, ulcers. Venous ulcers have a perforator vein. If you map them, or you're the provider looking at the mapping and there's no perforator, have the patient stand up, stand there for a while and find it. This is back uh, from 96, the hemodynamic and clinical improvement after superficial vein ablation and primary combined venous insufficiency with ulceration. And they did the SEPS procedure along with stripping. And this is before we had lasers. And they found that when they treated the saphenous reflux and the perforator veins, the ulcers went away virtually all the time. And this led us to using the sur this particular surgery for doing perforator veins. Then out came the lasers in 0405, and we switched over to lasers, and we found it was much easier than the SEPS procedure. Uh, SEPS is, again, is uh, subfascial endoscopic perforator surgery where they actually clip off the perforator vein. But now we do laser for it. Here's a study done in uh, 2011 uh, from the Western Vascular Surgery Society. In, in the journal Society for Vascular Surgery. They were treating, they looked at uh, treating people with uh, venous insufficiency and ulcerations. They treated the saphenous vein and the perforated veins associated with, it, associated with it, and they found that the res time to resolution of the ulcer went from seven months on average down to just about three months, uh, three months. So seven months down to three months, huge difference in quality of life. They didn't really look at uh, recurrent rate, and they found that the average person had about two perforating veins. This is in the Society for Clinical Vascular Surgery. They looked, uh, this is in 2012. They looked at people with fives and sixes uh, that had uh, you know, recurrent ulcers, and they looked at recurrence rates. They treated people with saphenous reflux with the radiofrequency or laser, then they treated uh, people that had discoloration in their legs, they had prior ulcers, or they had ulcerations, they would treat the perforators, and they found that their recurrence rate was 4.8% of the ulcer. If they tr did not treat the perforator veins, the recurrence rate at 12 months was 67%. So 67% recurrence rate at one year, if you didn't treat the perforators, and less than 5% if you did. The question is, can you get that down to zero if you did a better job at treating perforator veins? I don't know. Another study, this is done in uh, 2011. Uh, endovenous laser ablation of great status vein and perforating veins improves stasis and ulcer healing. And what they did is they 
this was a really interesting thing to me because it was between 2005 and 2010. They kind of started doing this before we really understood the importance of perforated veins. And they looked at their charts and they found that if they treated the leg ulcers with saphenous ablation alone, some of the ulcers healed. Uh, and they had some, some reasonable outcomes. There still was a kind of fairly high recurrence rate. But if they did both the saphenous vein and a perforator vein, they basically all healed. And what that tells us is that they missed them. They missed the perforator veins when they didn't treat them. So you really got to look for them. If you see a leg ulcer or significant discoloration or prior ulcer, chronic skin changes, there's a perforating vein underneath there. You got to find it and treat it. Okay, and that's really paramount. So we started the vein as a the practice as a saphenous ablation place. Now we're turning into an ugly leg place where we got to do a lot more perforators. Present status of surgery of the uh, venous system management of venous ulcer and the evidence for role of perforator interruption. This is just a review from the American Venus Forum, and they say it's a late level 1A recommendation. 1A means that's your highest level of recommendation with extensive research behind it. That uh, treatment of great saphenous vein ablation and uh, a perforator treatment is the standard for treating venous ulcers. Impact of ablation on incompetent superficial perforated veins on ulcer healing rates. In this study, it showed that uh, the ulcers healed, and typically, uh, like 75% of them healed in just a few months, and the recurrence rate at two years was less than 5%. So that's clearly the standard of care. Well, another paper here, this is the uh, the care of patients with varicose veins and associated venous disease, clinical practice guidelines of the Society of Vascular Surgery and American Venous Forms. This is 2011. This is a standard of care that we need to be following. In this article, they talk about a few things that are very important. We recommend that in patients with chronic venous insufficiency, perforating veins are selective, should be selectively treated if they have a reflux of greater than, 400, uh, greater than 500 milliseconds and they are associated with ulcers closed open or chronic skin changes and it's very and they also say that when you have uh, varicose veins if you have somebody that has a perforator vein that is not associated with ulcer they should only be treated selectively and selectively would mean that you don't have to treat it because they see it but if they have skin changes there or they have a large varicosity associated with it then we should treat it but I'm understanding that sometimes there's a confusion about which perforator vein is to treat we treat perforator veins that are causing disease not the ones we find so if you have a if you have a perforator vein that is associated with ulcer or significant skin changes, treat it. If you have a perforator vein attached to a large varicosity that you're not going to do a phlebectomy on, you're going to inject it, treat it. If you have a patient come back that's got persistent symptoms and it seems to be related to the perforator vein, you can treat it. But otherwise, it shouldn't be, it doesn't need to be treated. Another thing is that Medicare made a specific uh, guideline for perforated vein treatments, and you're allowed to do these as a separate standalone procedure. So if you're treating a skin ulceration, Find the perforator veins just frequently more than once. Treat the saphenous reflux, and you can bring them back for subsequent visits to treat their perforated veins. What I like about that is it allows us to do the radio frequency in the saphenous veins, which people have a little less post-operative discomfort on. We're really comfortable with that. And then we can bring them back later on and do the laser just on the perforator vein when they're associated with ulceration or healed ulceration or significant chronic skin changes. You have to code that case as varicose vein with ulceration. We talk about the CEAP classification for four, five, and six. So a four is skin changes. There's something called a four B, which means that there's signs that, that there's ulcer is gonna occur, or it has occurred in the past, such as uh, atrophy blanche. Then there's CA classification five, which means they have a healed ulceration, clearly a healed ulceration. Six is an ulceration. Well, if they're, if they're a four B, five, or six, the diagnosis is varicose vein with ulceration, and then you're, you can do a standalone perforator procedure on it. You can even bring back in to do it again if appropriate. There's another one. So those don't have to be combined procedures. We always find combined procedures. People have more pain and discomfort. And we like using the radio frequency. They're having more, more comfort afterwards. So I like to move to using the laser for the perforator veins associated with skin changes and ulceration. So varicose vein with ulceration, standalone procedure, and then stick with the RF for the, for the ablation. If we try to do the RF for the ablation and then the, the laser for the perforator, they're not going to pay for those two different things. So that's how we can alter our practice. Then if you see a perforator vein that's not related to significant disease, you don't really need treating and let it go. Another question is on treating ulcers is uh, I'm hearing that some people are putting patients in the unaboots. Uh, and I want to clarify this and I'll talk about this in the compression section. Unaboots were developed by Dr. Paul Una in 1910. And you always got a question, are you using something now that was 
invented in 1910 because this is kind of a legacy or not? Well, studies have shown that if you use inelastic compression, which are those ones with the straps, insurance covers them, uh, they heal four times faster than with Una boots. Una boots are probably the least, they, no, not probably, they are the least effective way to heal alterations. Una boots are out. Okay, we cannot offer those in our practice. I know there's some patients in it. You can finish them up, but don't use them again, please. Get in elastic stockings. We'll talk about that in the compression sec section. So in something that works 400 times better, or 400 percent better. That's what we got to use when it's easier for the patient. That's what we got to use. Make them look and feel better, easier. And something that's old, you know, traditional and doesn't work. Stop using it. And then the other question is, I've heard, well, I want to get these this ulcer under control before treating them. Okay, stop that. Okay, this is nonsense. We we talked about this before. An ulcer treated with the best compression therapy, not Unaboots, but this regular compression like inelastic, will heal in about seven or eight months. But if you treat the perforator, it heals in three months. Don't put your patient through four months of unnecessary boots and stressing. That's inappropriate. Additionally, the Society for Vascular Surgery in the American Venus Forum says, specifically as guideline 9.2, we recommend against conservative management for patients with symptomatic varicose veins, not just ulcers, varicose veins and ulcers, uh, if they are a candidate for endovenous ablation. Okay, so they're saying if they're a candidate for ablation, treat them. Don't do conservative management. It is unnecessary. What, what's happening is that we have a treatment that reverses it, essentially cures 95% of them with the, with, the, with the treatment. So the idea of putting them in, in boots for six or eight months is inappropriate standard of care. It's putting a burden on the patient. It's putting a huge burden on the healthcare industry. You know, this wound care stuff for things that we can cure is really nonsense. Billions and billions of dollars a year. And they also recommend uh, uh, using compression when you're treating the perforators, they don't recommend the type of compression. Uh, if you're doing a perforator vein and we know it's going to help in about three months, you can just use regular graded compression stockings. Stop the Una boots. If you think they need Una boots, use inelastic compression. This is a device they can get at the medical supply store. And we'll review that in the compression section. So, in summary, perforator veins with ulceration, skin changes, or healed ulceration, that's varicose vein with, with ulceration, that's an indication for standalone laser ablation of the perforator vein. Do the RF on the saphenous reflux, bring them back in for the perforator vein. They'll have more, more comfort, they'll get good healing, uh, it'll be easier for the patient. The patients who have a large varicosity associated with a perforator vein, do those along with the ablation. So you're going to have to use a laser in those patients because it's maybe not appropriate to do that as a standalone procedure. It hasn't been identified as a standalone procedure doing it with just a varicosity. And you treat them. And then the people that just have perforator veins that you notice, don't worry about them. So look for the perforator veins when their skin changes, ulceration, ugly legs. If they have just varicosities that aren't really large, don't bother looking for them. And if they have a big varicosity, we might just look for a perforator associated with and treat them selectively. Uh, in some cases, it's not even necessary if you're going to do a phlebectomy. Thank you very much.